But if you want to know what's the highest conversion rate for time spent, in my opinion, there's no, no, nothing close to other than SOI, it's expired listings. I always look at the winter is the time to lay groundwork with your sphere of influence, the people you know, okay? And I know none of us wants to hear that. We always are looking for, and, and we are going to talk today about different lead sources for real estate agents and what we do with them. So it's not gonna be just me harping on your SOI, but I do have to harp on your SOI up front a little bit because I wanna make sure you understand this. Um, the importance of it. Usually when we get into the winter months, the amount of available leads goes down, the available inventory goes down. So it is harder to find the low hanging fruit and the low hanging fruit are people that are actively looking to buy property that you can latch your little clutches into and help them find a house or the seller that urgently needs to sell their house or wants to put their home up for sale that you know or may not know. Those two types of people are the low hanging fruit that you typically see in the busier seasons of the year. When we move into the winter months and off season, that's usually the only time that we dedicate to really working our sphere of influence solely at a really high level. Okay. Because our sphere of influence is who in the spring and summer, a good percentage of them and a good percentage of the people they know are going to buy and sell property in the upcoming year. But that's very hard for us as agents to do work because we're just impatient creatures. So we don't want to lay groundwork. We just want to go for the people that want to buy or sell now. So we'll never put our sphere of influence together. And unfortunately, if we don't ever do that, we're never going to be a top agent because that is the one thing all top agents do, right? So we get that together. And as Candace said, we don't just put it together. We actually use it and we try to make contact during these times. And I don't think there's ever been an easier winter to make contact to your SOI than there has been this time. I mean, this is simple. Like everybody's isolated at home. People need good holiday cheer. They need virtual client events. They need distractions. They need engagement. It's never been received in a more positive fashion than someone reaching out to you than it has been right now. People have never been less busy. I mean, trust me, if you ask them, they'll tell you they're busy, but they're not, they're, they're busy, busy. They're busy shuffling Christmas decorations around their house because they're getting really locked down. Traditionally, for the last 30 years that I've been in this industry, we look at the winter as SOI time. I mean, think about it in the spring and summer, you're busy as heck. I mean, that's the hardest time to call your SOI because you yourself don't have time for it. You're out there crazy showing property. You've got lots of listings, lots of buyers. So it's very hard for you to make the time. And if you do make the time, you're trying to chase the low hanging fruit. Like you're going after that buyer who's looking right now or that seller around the corner from one of your listings that's thinking about selling that you happen to know about. So you start chasing them. The last thing you typically are going to do is try to work the people you know on the off chance that sometime in the near future, a small percentage of them might list or buy. So it's a last resort, even though we know it must be your first resort. Let me show you why it must be your first resort really quick. And this is pretty darn important here. I'm gonna share my screen with you. This is like the biggest disclosure on the planet before I start talking about leads. So this came out of the California Association of Realtors 2019 housing market survey. It's the last good referral based survey I've seen in a while. I often use the National Association of Realtors ones, but this one broke it down really well. But you can see here, how did clients find their agents? So agents that closed or buyers and sellers that closed with an agent, you can see that the first category says they represented them in a previous home transaction. So that's like a past client, clearly a member of your sphere of influence. That's 20% of them. Another 20% said the client was a friend, relative, or neighbor. That's a member of your sphere of influence as well too. Then one of their clients referred them to another client. So a client referral, also an SOI sphere of influence lead. Okay. Recommendations of friends. Um, I think it's the same thing as a referral from a client. Maybe it's more subtle referral, but regardless, that's your SOI. Is your friends are referring you to other people. 
a referral from a business associate. That's one of your business associates. They should be in your sphere of influence as well too. So it isn't until we get down here to the open houses at 4.6%. And if you add up these top five categories, they equal 77% of clients. 77% of home transactions in the United States went through SOI. You guys get that? 77% of all transactions. So I want to try to flush this out for you. And you've heard this before that 88% of all deals in the or 80% of all deals done in the United States are done by referral. So why are you guys all freaked out about buying online leads? They're part of the 23% or prospecting for expired listings. They're part of the 23% or holding open houses. They're part of the 23% or running Facebook ads. They're part of the 23%. Those are all, or farming neighborhoods. They're part of the 23%. You see all of those different things, and, I, and I'm not knocking those things. I coach and train all of those at nauseum. I make a living off those things. But understand, those are all marketing to people you don't know. And they represent 23% of the transactions. You get that? With every single study, you can see 77% of the transactions were done through an agent that was in relationship or was referred by someone they were in relationship with in their SOI. This is the great marketing magic trick that has been done on real estate agents for so long it's unbelievable because you, quite frankly, you just get bored of hearing that you need to call your people. You need to call your people. You need to keep your people close. It gets boring. If I make a video and put it on YouTube about how you need to call your people, no one's going to watch my video. It's boring. Make sense? So what do we do? We create a bunch of other magic pills to get agents to subscribe to us, to buy our coaching. That's right. Like Eisenhower Coaching and Consulting totally sells out. I've actually talked about it with my staff before. We put out complete smoke and mirrors marketing. Call us, we'll get you to make a million dollars and you can do it by converting Facebook leads or something stupid like that, that no one's ever done, ever. You got that? If you look at all the top agents in this country, they are all 60 to 90% SOI agents and they get a little bit of sauce on the side from these fun gimmicky things that you're tying yourself to. And there is no exceptions to this. And if you think you got one, I will debunk it in 10 seconds because they, are, they haven't done it for two or three years straight yet. If you've ever witnessed someone that tried to prospect for business from someone they don't know at a high level, and I have a very high standard for what a high level is, for multiple years, I'm gonna show you someone who burns out on it very, very quickly and starts looking for other avenues within the industry. Happens every time. I know because we get a lot of those people coming to my coaching company. I am so burned out. I want to quit. I am tired of calling six hours a day to people I don't know and getting screened at and only to find out they never put an SOI together. Again, I love prospecting for expired listings. I love circle prospecting. I love door knocking. I love farming. I love all of that stuff as an accoutrement, right? As a side dish, not as the steak. It's the veggies on the side. This makes sense. So before we talk about different lead sources and which ones are better than other words, understand there is one king, okay? And it's SOI and all the top agents know it. But guess what? They're not getting on YouTube talking about, I'll give you a great example. I'm gonna give you the best example of this that I know. And a lot of people on this, this call know uh, the late Kevin Blaine, okay? Kevin was the number one real estate agent. He was a very, very close friend of both mine and Albert's for a very long time and he's in one of our offices and um, you know, his team was selling over 1500 units per year. And what happened is he got really big and he, he was one of the first to develop an inside sales agent division on his team, an ISA team. He had a team of like five ISAs that proudly converted about 400 to 450 transactions at their peak. That's a lot of deals done by a small group of people prospecting online leads, okay? So he got famous for, got up on stage at national conventions. I remember Gary Keller one time talking to him on stage and asking him, you know, hey man, you know, you know, the whole point of the entire panel or interview up on stage at, um, I believe it was family reunion, was 
for Kevin to reveal the secrets of his ISA division, which he did. And it was very impressive. And everybody and their mother wanted to start an ISA division. But most people missed one very important section of that conversation. It's when Gary asked Kevin, hey, what is your biggest lead source? And he goes, oh, clearly our spheres of influence. He goes, how many transactions do you get from those? He said 850. The dude's up there for closing 450 transactions through his ISA team, but he did twice as many through SOI. Guess what? Everybody just totally glazed over that point because they've already heard that. Make sense? Success leaves clues, but you got to pick them up. If you don't want to listen to the boring old SOI conversation, so be it. If you want to go chase the high hanging fruit that's hard to get to and it's not quite ripe yet, go for it. Because it's harder to squeak out those lower price deals. I can't imagine trying to chase, you know, a force registration lead or a Google Play pay-per-click lead or a Facebook lead at a much lower price point when you could be attacking your SOI at a much higher rate, much better price and much better price point. So start there first. Make sense? And that's why. So that's what I, as far as lead sources go, SOI is king. Okay, so that's the big disclosure. Philip, yes, Kevin did pass away a couple years ago. So, um, so yes, he did. Josh, I'm gonna get to some of those tools. Philip, looking at his revised 135 for 2021 database, uh, depending on what type of database that is. Um, if you're, that probably is SOI database, I bet. Uh, social media, my third is circle prospecting my listings and sold. What could be a better major three? Okay, bear with me, we're gonna get there. I'm gonna show you, see what you're gonna have to humble me on is I, we're gonna talk about the different lead sources, but you have to let me show you how we track them as I show you the different lead sources, okay? Because I know tracking is not sexy talk. You know, it's kind of like a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down. This is the medicine part that you have to let me sneak in, okay? So I'm gonna show you something here. This is an example of an inventory pipeline, which I have showed you guys before in the past. So you can see here, this down here at the bottom, we have the listing inventory pipeline, the buyer inventory pipeline, and then our current pending con inventory. That means they're under contract um, on their way to close. We have offer and acceptance. Listing inventory, we've got up here in front of us where we track the active listings we have that are actively for sale up on the market. Then we have the list people where we have a listing agreement signed, but they haven't really gone up on the market yet. Maybe we're still getting it staged or getting photos done or whatever there, but we've signed the agreement. We're preparing it to go live on the market. And then down at the bottom, these are listing leads. These are people that I would qualify as an A lead or a hot lead in our uh, lead follow-up campaign categories that I talked about a couple weeks ago. These are people we know that want to list their home within the next 12 months, within the next year. But we do not have a listing agreement signed. And if that's the case, I want you to understand that. These are the most important people in your universe. You do realize that? In your work universe, these are the most important people in it. Because these are people that we know want to list their home in the next 12 months. No one deserves your attention more than these people, okay? So they need a lot of love from you until they sign the listing agreement and we can move them up into this category then they need a little bit less love from you because you've got a bird in the hand. The bird has signed the contract. We don't need you to squeeze the bird to death. Weird analogy, um, weird metaphor, but I make them up as I go, okay? Now, if you look over here by way of lead sources, notice how the source on this hypothetical team is always tracked down this column right here. You guys see that? So you can see this particular listing came from Robin's sphere of influence, a member of the team. This came from a different member of the team, Carrie's sphere of influence. This lead was picked up at an open house. This was a referral from another real estate agent, maybe out of state or something. This lead was picked up from a website, okay? So you can see here's from a farm, here's from Zillow, et cetera, et cetera. Now we can track leads through any CRM, through command. I do it off spreadsheets not because I'm old, I am old, but because I can teach better from them. So I can put them up on a screen and show you whatever I want to that way. I don't really care how you source it, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, I also like spreadsheets because I can pop them up in a team meeting 
and a, an agent can pop them up in their team's meeting and really see everything at once in a very clear way. Because I will tell you, this is the time of the year at the end of the year where myself and all my coaches are going over what we call lead sourcing. So we'll go back and say, okay, add up all your leads. Let's see where all your business came from this year. And it's like magic. Guess who comes, guess what lead source comes up with about 80% of all each team's business. Anybody want to guess? Let me guess. It's SOI. Thank you, Alfred. That's beautiful. That someone was listening. That's great. Through repetition. Uh, but that is, uh, that's fabulous. Right. It almost always adds up to SOI every single time. And then they're shocked. Oh man. And we put so much time into energy into so many other things. What if we just pounded our SOI harder? What if we just drilled down on that one thing and did a better job with the one thing that's getting us the most results? Sound familiar? So that's the idea. Um, so I'm not saying we shouldn't do other things, but boy, I think when you do this, and this is something I want you all to do is I want you to track throughout the year. So it's very easy to source at the end of the year. Okay. Now look at the buyer inventory pipeline. So again, uh, this also nicely highlights all the people that should be getting your most attention. These people should be getting, if we know they're looking to list, we are doing everything we can to move these people up to listing agreement sign. We're trying to basically get in front of these people. How do I get in these people's houses? What can I do to get in their living room? Because if I get in their living room, I'm one step closer to getting a listing agreement sign. Buyer inventory, same deal on the buyer side. You can see we are sourcing all of our leads the exact same way on the buyer side. This one's a little, and again, this is a team, but this works just the same with solo agents. You just have one SOI, yours. But if you move down below, the same thing, there's just two categories. You have active buyer leads, which means we don't have a buyer agency agreement signed yet until we get up here to get a buyer agency agreement signed. That's called a buyer listing. And please, 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 please do them and don't have a bad attitude about them. You know who has bad attitudes about them? Low producers. I'll just make that note. Make sense? Okay. So that's the idea. So again, your focus, these people should be your biggest focus right now. These are actively looking people. We are trying to put a lot of attention on these people until we can get in front of them and get them up here. This is the key to low inventory markets, guys. This is the key to low inventory markets. And I, I'm gonna stop and explain this to you guys because this is this important. If you guys are out there, one of these agents that are complaining that there are not enough houses to show to your clients or that you cannot find a house for your clients or I just can't make any money because there's not enough inventory for my clients, please stop saying that you're focusing on the wrong thing. You're, you're acting like a low producing agent. The problem isn't that there isn't enough inventory. That's the best freaking problem we can have in this business. That means we are in a red hot appreciating real estate market. You know, the last time we had low inventory like this, they called it the housing boom. Doesn't sound like a problem time, but yes, with every silver lining, there is a touch of gray. I'm going to keep saying it until someone picks up on that, but I, I said it last two weeks, but no, anybody get it? No one, nobody out there. There's none of you. Great. Without okay. a silver lining, there's no touch of gray. Yeah. Some, yeah. Well, if you know what I'm talking about, you'll know what I'm talking about, but that's all right. No big deal. So the, uh, so I, I throw them out there every now and then to see if anybody, it just takes a real musical, a musical mind to get Grateful it. Dead. Thank it's you, beautiful. Rick. Someone it, it's got to find a deadhead out there. All right, good. So, what I mean, I went with a real mainstream Grateful Dead song, me most. So anyway, <laughs> um, that should have been easy. So anyway, I've been saying dead quotes in this group. No one really knows it for about, I think, two or three months now. So I've just been waiting for someone to pick it up. I'll keep it going. You guys can you guys can look for those. So that is the problem with a great real estate market when it's red hot and you have a lot of sales volume. You just have low inventory because everybody wants to buy it. But we can't focus on that problem. Yes, you're going to need a lot. What, where your focus needs to be on is getting more buyers. If you've only got three buyers and you cannot find them a house, well, sounds like you need six buyers, maybe nine buyers. Does that make sense? So your focus gets away from conversion. You're trying to convert the three buyers you have into 
a contract. You're, that's not lead generating, that's lead converting. We have to, hey, we've done all we can. We get them set up on listing e-alert emails, we check in on them, we try and show them a property when we can, but other than that, we set it and forget it. And then we spend all our energy trying to get more buyers. Because if you need to do the same amount of business now in this low inventory market, than you would have, I don't know, seven years ago, then you need to carry more buyers. Because if you have 10 active buyers right now, there's a much stronger likelihood that one of them is gonna be putting a house under contract every single week. Just like in 2007. 2007 on the listing side, you can handle that two ways. There's the wrong way, which is I'm gonna focus on buyers now because listings won't sell. That would be the wrong way. That's the low producer route. The successful route is I'm gonna get, I'm gonna carry three times the amount of listings that I used to carry in 2005 because then I'll still put the same number under contract that I would have before. So I'm just gonna have more signs up, play the numbers. So right now with buyers, you must play the numbers. Your energy goes to lead generation away from conversion. And if there's anything that you should get tattooed on your lower back, it is that. I spend time lead generating, not lead converting. Because if, if you can understand the difference between the two, which is much harder than it sounds, and then devote your energy to lead generation, you won't ever say those terrible low producer words, which is, I just can't find a house for any of my clients. That's low producer talk. What you should be saying is, how do I find more buyers? Because I can't control the inventory and I can't control my buyers. What you're going to end up doing is running off your buyers because you're pushing them too hard. All right, so that's the plan. Okay, lastly, let me get back over to this inventory pipeline and we'll be done with, the, with this part of the tracking. We are going to talk about lead sources. Is the pending inventory, this one's pretty boring. I hope you all have this one um, somewhere and I know you all have access to it. Uh, in command again. Um, but you can see here, we are still sourcing all the way through. Once the buyers and sellers from our listing and buyer inventory pipeline down here go under contract, then we move them over here to our pending inventory uh, pipeline. So you're basically taking the same data. So we should be sourcing all the way through. And then when it closes, we know where it came from. So it starts with putting the source in the, pi in the uh, inventory pipelines. And then when it gets through to your pending inventory, it's going to stay there until it closes. And then you've got the source and, and um, any CRM will then tally those sources up for you accordingly. Make sense to everybody? Thoughts, questions, concerns, ideas? Brian, this is so cool because it totally resonates uh, going back, even thinking back when I started real estate, because just like you said, that's all they've always told us is sphere of influence. Start with the sphere of influence. Even in Ignite, it's like, start with everybody you know. And as a new agent, I was like, okay, that's cute. That's awesome. But no, I'm going to go pay for leads. I'm going to go do everything. And then I was like, wow, things are not closing. And when you look at what you, what I closed back in 2009, my first clients were always people that I knew, even though I wasn't really marketing to them, it just kind of, it was default business. Mm -hmm. And it goes back to when I was, uh, when prior to COVID, when we had agents walking in the office and they'd come and they'd sit down and they'd talk to me in my office and say, Greg, I don't know where else to go. I need leads. And I tell them, call your sphere of influence, people that are on your phone. I've called everyone. I'm like, really? Well, what would get them is when I'd have them sit in front of me, we close the door and say, great, start calling. Let's see. And I want you to do a follow-up call then. And the calls were always, well, I'm going to start, not this one. Well, not this one. They start going down the list. And I'm like, well, that's funny because you're willing to pay $50, $100 a month for people you don't know, but the people that you claim you don't know or that you wouldn't call, you won't even call. As they'd start calling, all of a sudden, those weren't calls like, Oh yeah, I'm following up on them. There were calls like for the first time where they didn't even know who these people were. And then when they come to a business, they're like, oh, well this business, I'm not going to call. At a time where we're at right now with COVID, this is a great time to call the businesses that are in your phone. And for some reason, they ended up in your phone. Every single contact you have in your phone, there is a reason they're in there, even though you might not remember. And if you don't remember, a better time to call and find out why are you in my phone? Who are you? Why do I know you? And what can I do for you? And how are you doing? So it was, it's just funny because as you're saying this, we will hear it. And I, I still, even after that happened, I was like, okay, I'll still wait. And I'd kind of go through it. And I just remember even going to something as my sister when they told me, call your family, I'm like, well, my sister's not gonna buy, are you kidding? When I even tell her to buy a computer, she's like, oh, that's too expensive. Oh my God, yeah. there's no way. And yet 
I remember calling and it was, um, Sean Kokoska also had told me that at that point called. And I just remember my sister going, oh my God, yeah, I've seen that rates have gone down. You know, maybe I might think about it. And I'm like, almost fell on my, on my back. Cause I'm like, wait, my sister would want to buy a second house. Like she already owns a property in California. Why would she buy a property in Texas? She bought her first investment property. And this was just a call that I was like, I'm just going to get him off my back. I'm going to call my sister. And that was her first investment property, 2009. And she still has it in San Antonio, Texas. When I had already set my mind that she was not going to buy anything. And there was no reason for me to call her. And let me tell you, started calling my family. Looking back even now, most of my business are people that I knew. You know, very rarely, I mean, you do get the default. And then when you get the default, you're still in your mind, you're like, you see, it does work. But then when you go back and look at the back and, and relook at your business, you're like, yeah, no, it's a lot more people that I knew is my business. It, referrals and so forth is really where it's coming from. It's not just a, I went and I paid. And when you do pay, it's a lot more work to try to get them to convert to an actual client. Because you will call, 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 call from a Zillow call or, you know, those leads that are coming in. And then you have to be committed to work that business. It's not just going to happen. Certainly a lot more calls. There's no doubt about it. Mm -hmm. When you're, when you're prospecting for business from people you don't know, let me tell you, it is a lot more calls. There's no Gregory doubt. About really it. hit the nail on the head too. He just showed how limiting beliefs get in our way. We, we okay. look at a name and we assume we make our minds up for them. And that's really unfair. If you think about it, I mean, Wait. his sister could have missed out on a great opportunity. Um, so we shouldn't assume what the, what our SOI would do. And I think too, Brian, to your point of ancillary ways to lead generate, if we focus on our SOI as our main source, the secondary ways are going to automatically show up as we get listings, we're going to need to circle call around them. As we sell a home to a buyer, we can circle call. We have open house opportunities. So the rest of it automatically shows up if we start with our sphere. That Yeah, thank you guys for all of those points, actually. It's uh, more of the same. So I hope everybody gets the fact that um, about what's important by way of lead sources, because uh, you, if not, you will continue to hear this from everyone in this industry that knows what they're talking about until the end of your career. Um, so let me jump, let me, let me segue since we're going to be talking about the, or we are talking about the best lead sources for agents, I want you all to take an open mind about different lead sources for a minute. Okay. I have always said this, um, and I think I made this up, but, um, I'm not hundred percent sure. Cause I am getting old, but you'll have prospecting. Oh, I'm trying to make my hand go totally sideways. There we go. We'll have prospecting over here. And then my other hand, this is tough because of my broken pinky. Do you guys see it? It's, it's there. That's my broken pinky. Um, so if I turn it sideways, you can definitely see it. See that? The uh, <laughs> Half the people on the Zoom conference just threw up when I went like that. But anyway, so over here <laughs> is a timeline. And on this side of the timeline, we have got those people that work a referral-based business that work their SOI. <laughs> so over here you have your referral-based business. I want to grow the people, the, the group of people I know. Um, I want to work with the people I know and I want people calling me and I want to just have a group of VIPs over here. Okay. Then you got the other school and these are your prospectors. Okay. These are people who prospect for business from people I don't know. So they might be um, prospecting for expireds. They might be um, converting online leads, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Like we talked about earlier. Okay. Usually these two people are so juxtaposed, it's unbelievable. So the SOI people are like, I will never cold call people. I would never, ever want to. I hate it when people that I don't know call me and I don't want to call them. The last thing I want to do is cold call people. I just want to work with the people I know that trust me and I trust them. Okay. That's their, that's their knock on pride. Then you go over here to the prospectors on the other side and they're like, Hey, I want to call people that want to buy and sell real estate. The last thing I want to do is call people I know and pretend like I want to be their friend and buddy up to them with the hopes that someday they'll use me. I want to keep working and, uh, and personal life balanced. So I'm not going to do that. 
Do that? Do, do those two arguments surprise any of you? Usually, there's huge ahas everywhere. Like you never saw the other side's point of view ahas. Because here's the deal: they're both right. They're also both wrong, and it goes to show how much your mind gets in the way with lead generation. Because I can tell you the prospector is calling online leads that are searching for homes online. The prospector is calling expired listings. Those are people that just had their house up for sale and couldn't sell it. These people dying to sell. Whereas the SOI person is calling people just because to wish them happy, for, you know, Merry Christmas, laying groundwork like we talked about. So that will be the one time ever that you hear me say something negative about SOI. And I did it only to segue into prospecting. Okay? That's why I had to do such a long go SOI speech. All right? So there is a difference, but I recommend with everyone, I believe every single agent, team, and organization needs to build a sphere of influence first. And that should be the bulk of your business, the foundation. Then we're going to have a, one or two other pillars, lead generation pillars of our business that are out there trying to get new business from people we don't know. Not only are we getting the business and the money from those transactions, we're also collecting those people in our basement where I store all the people. Just kidding. That's a joke. Gosh, we're collecting those people in our SOI database so that we're growing our SOI database because we're reaching out and meeting these people through our prospecting efforts. So we're going to grow our SOI as well too. And they'll become repeat clients and they'll refer us to people they know. So it's a nice logical arm to work alongside the SOI. In other words, they don't need to be juxtaposed. They should work side by side in tandem. A lot of my competitors out there in the world will say, this is the right way and this is the wrong way. Do it my way. I do not agree with that. I agree with they work perfectly together. That lead generation works with your SOI and prospecting for business from people you don't know very well together. So I do think a lot of the other sources that I was trying to knock to get your attention earlier work, work very well. I'm going to tell you what I think are the best lead sources in addition to as an accoutrement, a side dish to the SOI. Hey, Brian, can I ask you a very important question? Yeah. Does accoutrement really mean side dish? No, accoutrement <laughs> is like a, it's a, uh, it's, um, it's, it is a side. It's not necessarily a dish though. Accoutrement, it's an accessory. It's accessory, like a purse. Yeah, okay, got it. Yeah, right. yeah, it's not food. All right. Yeah. But I, one example, one analogy was food. The other one was like clothing accessories. <laughs> okay. That's what I was going for. I also like to say accoutrement. You know, I, I think it's fun. I like French accents. Okay. Don't know really any of the language, but I do like <laughs> it. Um, okay. So I'll start with this. If you're going to prospect for business from people you don't know, I honestly believe that you can get the most business with the least amount of time spent and the least amount of money probably by, does anybody guess what I'm gonna say? It's tough. Anyone? Anybody guess? Farming your area? No, that's not it, but a good guess. Asking for referrals from your SOI? I can't count SOI, remember? They're, they're the main dish. This is from all the accoutrements. <laughs> but you're right, that'd be better. That's it. Fizzbos or expired? Oh, expired listings is the answer. Chicken dinner. That is great. Well done, Betsy. Yes, uh, I put expired listings from a conversion rate potential. Um, it takes tw a good expired prospector, which a good expired prospector, which takes practice to become a good expired prospector, I will tell you. But someone that takes practice that has a good discipline down um, can get a listing appointment in 25 contacts. So if you can talk to 25 expired listing sellers, you will get one listing appointment. Now I can tell you, in our uh, office up in the Visalia area, we have uh, an agent named Apple Coreal, who is one of the most gifted expired prospectors I've seen. She actually did an entire year at a 17 to one ratio, which is the best I've ever seen. In other words, all she needed to do is talk to 17 people and she'd get a listing appointment. And that year she was like a listing appointment every day type of deal. 
And that's hard to do because there's all kinds of obstacles with being able to talk to 17 people, all kinds of obstacles. And you have to go through all those mental battles. Like they don't answer the phone. I can't get good numbers. They screamed at me, get used to all that. But if you want to know what's the highest conversion rate for time spent, in my opinion, there's no, no, nothing close to other than SOI, it's expired listings. That would be number, that would be number one, but boy, that's tough work. That's tough work. You're going to pick up the phone. You're going to call and that's all listings too. And guess what? You don't have to battle with price much because they've already tried their price. So they're, they're usually a lot more realistic on price. Okay. Thoughts, questions on that. I'm going to go through other ones too. Betsy, who's number two. What's the second one? Oh, I had said uh, FISBO. That's number. That's right. I went back to you. Good way to, way to pick up what I'm putting down. Um, that's right. Fizbo's I put at a 35 to one rate. So in other words, if you can stay in contact for a period of six to eight weeks with 35 for sale by owners, you'll get a listing. Does that make sense? Fizbo's are really hard for a totally different reason. Fizbo's freaking hate real estate agents. So you got to be mentally tough to deal with the fact that everything that comes out of their mouth is designed to not appreciate what you do for a living. <laughs> so if you can get past that, <laughs> then, then, uh, then you'll be fine. Ryan, you said 35? 35. Is that within, within mm -hmm. a month or for how long? No, with FISBOs are a little different than expired. They, you actually have to nurture FISBOs. So usually you've got some sort of action plan. Um, and these are all things that I can cover in these agent masterminds. Like we could have one on expireds. We could have one on FISBOs. We could have one on farming. We've had one on prospecting for online leads. Trust me, I've got content. So we could so do just this basically, one. basically until their house is sold. So no, no. I usually do a six to eight week nurture oh, plan, okay. but you go 10 week, you could do that. Um, where you're staying, you know, you're trying to, so typically you've got this nurture action plan that you put all your FISBO sellers through where they get like your pre-listing packet the first week, a CMA for their house, a second week, you give them an open house guest list the third week, the fourth week, you maybe try to coordinate an open house with them, you mm -hmm. know? Um, so you're trying to give them stuff. You're trying to come from that contribution. You're basically trying to make them hate you less <laughs> and less and less through that period. And then because it's some, I can't remember the stat here. I really should know this, but it's in my materials. I think it's like 70% of all FISBOs actually end up listing their house with an agent. So your key is just to stick around. So it's you at the end. Ryan, the last stat I heard, it's been several months ago though, is actually 94%. Oh, okay. It, it doesn't shock me. I, I, I really just picked a number just now. It's something really high like that. Mm -hmm. So your job is just to stay in conversation until they want a realtor and then you're the obvious choice. Realtor. There. It's really hard getting through that pronunciation. Good job. I'm proud of you. Jody monitors me and my, <laughs> and she's, she's reforming me. Realtor. Realtor. The, uh, it, it sounds like there should be like a, when I was little kids used to watch cartoons and I feel like there should have Not been a cartoon to. called Realtor, you know, and he was like, it was like Voltron. You put them together in parts. I just don't like the name. So that would be my next one. I would put um, Fizbo's in there next. Then I would, pr okay, this is where it gets tough because those are my next two. Now we've got a lot that are kind of the same. I'll go with circle prospecting next. It's when you're calling around an active listing for lots of different things. We need buyers. We've got a buyer for your neighborhood. We have an open house we're inviting you to in your neighborhood we're you know we're uh we're looking for more sellers we need listings things like that again we could have a whole topic on this um so i put circle prospecting out there next i put that out at about you know you know 50 to 1 60 to 1 you got to talk to that many people to get a listing appointment it's a little i love circle prospecting it's cheap it's easy the problem is you're you know with expireds you're calling people with expires and FISBOs, you're calling people that actively want to sell their home, right? They're just not able to do it. They couldn't do it with another agent when they're expired and they can't do it themselves with a FISBO. With SOI, you're calling people you know. With circle prospecting, it's the true cold call. It's the only true cold call. These people don't want to, we don't know that these people want to sell their home like FISBOs and expires. 
And we also don't know them personally, like SOI. So it's a little lower conversion rate, that's all. But I really like it, works at a very high level. It also actively typically serves to market your listings as well. So it's a great way to spot farm. In other words, if you've got a great listing in a great neighborhood, call around it, you pick your price point. So you'll see a lot of people call around every listing they get, especially if they want more listings in that neighborhood because they like the price point. All right, now let's move over to the digital arena very quickly. We have premium portal leads. And when I say portal, that's different than an online lead you purchase, even though you do purchase portal leads too. A portal lead is like a Zillow or a realtor.com. It's where the public, loves them and continuously goes on their apps and goes on their websites and insists on using those two neutral sources to look for homes on their own. The reason those leads cost so much money and, and man, they cost hundreds of dollars depending on your location per lead, hundreds of dollars per lead. Like you're not getting Zillow anymore for anything less than a hundred, $150 a lead. I don't care where you live. Usually you're up 200, $300 a week. Why? It's because these people are in this portal looking for property and then they click a little button that says, I want to talk to an agent. Give me an agent. That agent goes to you, the person that bought the lead and you pick up the phone. Hey, this is Brian with Zillow. Can I help you? Did you hear that? That's a customer service phone call. See how that's a much easier phone call than calling someone out of the blue. This is, you got a problem. I'm here to help the relationship flows much easier. That's why they're so freaking expensive. Zillow now teaches you to not set buyer consultation appointments. Zillow teaches you to get in the car and show the property. If that doesn't make every real estate trainer and coach want to eat their own stomach out, but it doesn't surprise me that Zillow is doing that because Zillow looks after Zillow, not you. Makes sense. So it is what it is, but that's what happens. So Zillow will tell you not to set buyer consultations. I guess you just bring a taser. I don't know. Pepper spray, that'll, that'll cover it. So uh, the, <laughs> so anyway, that idea, that's why Zillow and the portal leads, I call them premium leads, are so dang expensive online. Now then you jump down to a much lower tier. It's the only other tier and it's called force registration. Those leads either from Google pay-per-click ads, Facebook ads are much cheaper, okay? much cheaper, much lower conversion rate though, because understand the reason we call those forced registration is because people are going on your website or any website and they want to search for homes. And then a little squeeze box comes up and says, Hey, hey, hey if you want to search here, please give us your information in this little box. You type in that information. They're like, thank you. We're actually forcing you to register on our site. Then we give that to a real estate agent out the side and the real estate agent hopefully calls back in five minutes while that person is still looking on that website. But do you see how that doesn't feel like a customer service phone call? Because no one was expecting a phone call. No one asked for a phone call from a realtor either. So it's a little more difficult. Guys with me? That's why those leads will run down, you know, eight, nine bucks a lead. I know command has a great deal on them. They're outrageously cheap. So understand on those types of leads, on those forced registration style leads, you know, you're looking at a very small conversion rate. Okay. So please be ready for that. Um, you know, it, it gets kind of crazy there, but you know, you typically you're doing pretty good with those leads at about 2%, which means you got to talk to a hundred people. Does that make sense? Now I've seen 5%. I've seen it on forced registration leads. It's, I've not seen it for long. I've seen people claim it too, that I can't verify, but I think 2% is a good number. I like to be real honest with my numbers. And if you're, so if you get a hundred leads, you know, you might get two clients in there if you're doing things right. And you also need to nurture those. That's not assuming you're calling them all once. So you need to be calling them. And we've, we've had long conversations about this, which we can do again about online prospecting and online leads, but there's a lot of nurturing to get that 2%. You can't just call these people once. You won't get 1%. Makes sense. You got to keep staying with them because you're meeting them a lot sooner than you'd meet them with Zillow. That's the good side of forced registration is see they're going on Zillow and they're looking for a long time before they ask for you with forced registration. They don't even get to look until they ask for you, which means you're meeting them earlier in the home buying timeline, which means you can get them earlier. 
Make sense? What it also means is you need to be patient and nurture them because they're not quite ready to buy yet. They're just looking. So you need to help them just look for a while. So don't be too pushy. If you lose interest of them, we're gonna, we're gonna lose them and we're gonna lose our 2% conversion rate that we're going for. Um, with premium leads, when you're paying for Zillow leads and things like that, I mean, I've got a couple teams that push 20% conversion rates. That's out of control, but I really have a couple teams that do it. Very common to see 10% conversion rates on Zillow leads. I've seen 10% a lot, but they're expensive. I mean, you know, it, it, it costs you, cost you a lot of money. So just so you think about it, going forward, I'm going to wrap it up with this because I don't want to, I don't want to run over. These are all different topics we could discuss. I just need to hear from you guys what it is you want to discuss. Do we want to talk about expireds, FISBOs, circle prospecting, forced registration leads, how to convert Zillow leads, et cetera, et cetera. I hope you got lots of questions because I just, it's a very hard question to ask her. What are the best leads? Well, here they all are. They all have different pros and cons. These are the ones that are most popular. Now there's can a- I, Can I make a comment, Brian? What's that? Can I make a comment? Yeah, Brian. So I, th you know, the one thing that I, I'm pretty passionate about is that when you talk about those conversion rates, those are typically the conversion rates on the initial phone call when you actually talk to somebody, not factoring in that once you call that person and if they tell you to F off or I don't want or I'm not ready, if you have a phone number and an email address and you put them in your database and you nurture them for a period of time and you develop a relationship with that person, those leads actually become higher conversion over a period of time. But we have this mentality of we want it now, we want the business right now and not factoring in all the different events that happen in a person's life before they actually make a decision to move. And so I think take having a different mindset is that like, okay, I'm gonna call a hundred people now, I got a hold of two, but I'm gonna put the other 98 into my database and over a period of time, that conversion rate goes up significantly. Love it, Frank, you're hundred percent right. And thank you for quantifying. Like when we talk about these conversion rates, this assumes you are working these leads and I don't have time to explain to you all the action plans out there, but we will. I see some of you popping it in. Like I wanna hear about expireds, thanks. Nina, I appreciate that. I want to talk about circle prospecting. Thank you, Casey. Frank's right. You know, with those two ways, you can't just call them once. You know what I mean? You can't just call them once. We have to work a database over time. It's very hard to escape. Even if you pay for leads online, I mean, you'll have to do more telephone calls doing that than you will anything else. There's really no way to escape the phone. I promise you. And now that we have the internet, it has made the phone used that much more.